Hello, listeners. Welcome back to Luke's English Podcast. Here is yet another episode for you. That's right, another one this month. Um, I've just thrown like tons of episodes at you this month, haven't I? I really have. Um, I wonder if everyone's able to keep up. I expect that, in fact, uh, a lot of people are probably far too busy <laughs> to be listening to podcasts at this time of year. There is a thing actually in podcasting called the December dip, um, which unless you're in podcasts, you probably don't know about that. But that's basically because most podcasters notice that their listening numbers drop a little bit at this time of year because everyone out there in the world, or at least not everyone, but a lot of people in the world are at this time of year rushing around trying to get Christmas presents, uh, trying to book uh, train tickets um, and wrapping presents and going to Christmas parties and going to carol singing events at school or whatever it is. Now, obviously, not everyone listening to this podcast celebrates Christmas in the same way. Um and a lot of you out there, for you, Christmas is not such a big deal, which is, you know, totally fine. I guess it means your December is a little bit more, a little bit quieter. Um, obviously, I'm from England and in my country, uh, Christmas is a traditional thing. Um, you know, it's arguably it's it's a Christian festival. I mean, I'm not a particularly religious person, really, although I do come from a Christian background. You know, the UK, um, Christianity is the predominant religion, although... I would actually say that um, uh, people are not that religious these days. I think probably uh, most people aren't like most people don't really go to church or or um, you know um, follow uh, Christianity that closely really uh, but nevertheless christmas is still a big celebration for some people it's definitely a, a christian thing and it's it's time to go to church and and do all those things but i think for a lot of people uh, christmas is essentially like this sort of mid midwinter festival and it's really a time of spending um you know days with your family um celebrating giving gifts it's peace and love basically it's a time of peace and love and it's the season of goodwill that's the idea, um, the season of being friendly and generous and basically wishing peace and love um, for everyone, you know, and that's the that's 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 nice, isn't it? And that's the spirit with which I am providing you with um, yet another episode, peace and love in the world. And uh, I hope that, uh, you know, you are managing to have a reasonable time this year, basically. Um, so new episode. And in this one, I'm going to tell you a story and I'm going to tell you the story soon. OK, um, we're going to get into that as soon as possible. But, you know, I need to lead you into the story a little bit. Um, so this is the second kind of Christmas related episode I've done. The other one was a rambling episode, which I uploaded a few days ago. And if you're watching the video version of this episode, then you might notice that I've made a little bit of an effort uh, in this one in in the sense that I've got, I do have at least one sort of poor excuse, admittedly a, a poor excuse for a Christmas decoration. If you're just listening to the audio version, which I think most people are, then you can't actually see this, but I'll describe it to you. So I was on my way to my pod room this morning thinking, right, I'm going to record another kind of Christmassy episode. And I don't, I still don't have any Christmas decorations in my podcasting room at all. It's really not very festive in here. So I was on the way down after dropping off my I took my daughter to school, took my son to his his crash, and then on my way back here, I was like, right, I'll get something. I'll get like a little Christmas tree or maybe some fancy lights or something like that. And literally everywhere I went, I couldn't find anything uh, that was good enough. And the best thing I could get was in my local supermarket was a chocolate Father Christmas, a chocolate Santa. It's, it's a chocolate Santa wrapped up in shiny... Um, uh, sort of shiny tin foil or aluminium foil with a picture of Santa on it and he's he's it's you know it's a he's a very happy looking Father Christmas with a big smile on his face big bushy white beard he's holding a candle and some gifts and um, standing at his feet are two very happy looking children um, and if I wrap if I unwrap this it, it'll be chocolate right it's made of chocolate it's kind of like a hollow plastic Father Christmas chocolate I mean a hollow chocolate uh, Father Christmas, not a hollow plastic one. You can't eat plastic. Well, you could eat plastic, but you shouldn't. Anyway, it's a hollow chocolate Father Christmas. So Merry Christmas, everyone. This is the effort that I've made. And, um, 
yeah so i'm just gonna i'm just, i mean i'm i'm will i eat this later i don't know i might do uh although i'm not sure this is the best quality chocolate although having said that on the back of the um on the back of this father christmas um it does say uh this is superior milk superior milk chocolate now this is in french because obviously i live in france so um this is all written in french chocolat supérieur au lait so this is superior milk chocolate i wonder i doubt that i doubt i mean what does superior mean superior to what superior to like the worst chocolate which is that chocolate that you get from advent calendars or the chocolate that you get in chocolate money which is like borderline chocolate it's not even you know i'm not even sure you could legally you could probably legally call it chocolate but i don't know if it really tastes like chocolate but anyway this is apparently superior milk chocolate but what are the ingredients well the ingredient first ingredient is what sugar yeah first ingredient is sugar um and then they've got uh cacao uh uh butter right cocoa butter beurre de cacao cocoa butter um so anyway there you go i might eat it later i might not i might give it to my daughter uh, although i'm sure that she's going to have plenty of chocolate to eat or i might give it away to someone um i might give it away to someone who actually will want to eat it but anyway i'm going to let um father christmas sit there on my table he's just gonna he's gonna stand there on the table and he can watch me uh record an episode he's just gonna stand there watching me judging me <laughs> probably like come on luke get on with it that's what santa's saying just get on with it all right so 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 let's get started properly and i'm going to start reading from text on uh, a, a pdf here okay uh, there's a pdf for this episode so let me just get stuck into this episode all right then Merry Christmas, everyone. This time, I'm going to read you a classic Christmas ghost story. Woo! Written by Charles Dickens, called A Christmas Carol. Now, I have read this story on the podcast before, in episode 320, back in 2015. Okay? Some of you might remember that, long-term listeners, but I expect a lot of you listening haven't heard that episode, so I thought I would read it again here. Also, I just love reading this story. I like the spirit of the story. I mean, the message, right? Um, it has a good message for us all to remember. And I just love telling stories and acting out the characters. So I, I'm going to enjoy this and I hope you do too. Also, there's a video version this time. Um, episode 320 was audio only. And it's not going to be exactly the same as before. I've adapted the story a little bit more than I did last time to modernise the English slightly. The original text was written in 1843 and naturally the English is a bit old-fashioned by today's standards. So I've gone through the story and adapted it slightly to make the English a bit more up-to-date and hopefully a little bit more appropriate for learners of English hoping to learn the kind of English that everyone uses today. So I have adapted it slightly. I said slightly, it's still very similar to the original version, to be honest. Although I've tried to modernise it a bit, it's hard to rewrite the work of Charles Dickens, and so much of the text is still the same. So this is slightly modernised, but still quite old-fashioned English. But that's interesting to explore. And it's it's a lovely story, very well written story. Now, although this is described as a short story, it'll probably take about 45 minutes for me to read you the whole thing, right? For me to read the whole thing to you. So I'm not gonna explain all the vocabulary like I do in some episodes. The story is just, the story is too long for me to do that. If I explained all the vocabulary, the episode would end up being way too long. So I'm just going to read the story to you. I'm going to try to make it entertaining and clear. And I'll pause at certain moments to sum up what has happened in order to help you understand the main storyline. However, if you really feel that you need to understand certain vocabulary that you notice, just use one of the many online dictionaries that are available, including the ones that I usually recommend, the Oxford Advanced Learners Dictionary, dictionary.cambridge.org, collinsdictionary.com, the Longman Dictionary of Contemporary English Online. All great dictionaries, and you can just use them freely. Uh, find a word, that, you know, if you notice a word that you don't know, you can just 
copy and paste it into one of those dictionaries to kind of do some research and, and get to know the, the, the vocabulary, okay? Or you could even use ChatGPT, which can also be a useful tool for exploring vocabulary definitions and examples, especially examples. But for this episode, all you have to do is listen and enjoy this classic ghost story in English. And Father Christmas is going, come on, Luke, get on with it. If you don't hurry up, then I'm not going to give you any presents this year. Okay, I will, I promise. I'm going to, uh, we're going to get there very soon. PDF, there's a PDF available. You'll find the full text for this story on the page for this episode and there, there'll be a link in the description for it. Um, the PDF link is in the description. You can just download it directly in that description. Also, you'll find the PDF on the page for this episode on my website. With the PDF, you can take your time and read the story at your own pace, if you like, and you can copy and paste words or phrases into an online dictionary. Okay, so if you want to do your studying, there you go. To help you understand what you're about to hear, let me give you a very quick overview of the story and the main characters. This is important because I don't want uh, you to get lost in the story, okay? So, the story. A Christmas carol, that's the name of the story. A carol is actually a, a, a type of song, okay? Um, a Christmas carol is about a horrible man called Ebenezer Scrooge who only cares about money and is very mean and rude with everyone, including the people who work for him and indeed members of his family. The, 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 well, member, there's only one member of his family left. He's rude to everyone. At Christmas, Scrooge is visited by ghosts that show him visions of the past, the present and the future. The ghosts show Scrooge the truth about himself and he learns the real meaning of Christmas. He goes through a sort of transformation. The characters, so the, the main character is Ebenezer Scrooge. What a great name, Ebenezer Scrooge. He is cruel, mean, selfish, tight-fisted, which means he keeps his money to himself. He's stingy, which is another word for tight-fisted, I meaning he's not generous. He likes to keep his own money. He only cares about money. He mainly just works on his business, a small money lending company. So his business is to lend money to people, you know, and they, people who need money, they come to him, he, they borrow money from him. And then obviously they have to pay money back to him with interest. Right, we, you know, we all have to borrow money sometimes and it's, it seems so unfair to have to give it back with so much interest added, but you know, that's his business. That's Scrooge. Then you've got Scrooge's nephew, Fred. F Fred is Scrooge's only remaining family, the only family he has left in the world. That's Fred, his nephew. Then there's Jacob Marley. Jacob Marley is, or was, uh, Scrooge's business partner. So Marley is Scrooge's former business partner. He used to be his business partner, but he died seven years earlier. Okay. Uh, Bob Cratchit is Scrooge's clerk. That's his employee, someone who works for Scrooge. And uh, Bob Cratchit does uh, office work for Scrooge. And Scrooge pays him the minimum possible wage. So he doesn't pay him very much money. By the way, a clerk is an office worker, an accountant, someone who does basic office admin, right? And yeah, so Scrooge doesn't pay him very much money. He makes him work really hard all the time and makes him work in a very cold office with a very small fire. Yes, Bob Cratchit has a very large family and they're living on the poverty line, right? So they're, they're pretty much almost living in poverty. They don't have enough money. And the, you know, his children are sort of suffering as a result. Bob's youngest son is called Tiny Tim. Tiny Tim is sick and disabled. He has a problem with his legs or one of his legs and he has to walk with a crutch. A crutch is a wooden thing that you hold under your arm that helps you to walk, okay? Uh, Bob has hardly any money, but his family is close and loving. Then there are the three ghosts. In fact, there are four ghosts in this story, but I'm gonna tell you about three of those ghosts now. So Scrooge is visited by three ghosts and they are called the ghost of Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas present, and the ghost of Christmas future. And they show Scrooge Christmases 
from the past, the present, and the future. Then there's the phrase bar humbug, bar humbug. So this is just a final thing. Um, you, you'll notice that Scrooge often says bar humbug, and you might wonder what that means. So the bar part of it is just an expression of disdain or contempt. It's kind of a noise that Scrooge makes to show that he dislikes something like bar. Okay, humbug. This is an old fashioned word which Scrooge uses to say that he thinks Christmas is all just a big, it's all a big joke. It's a sham. It's a load of nonsense. He doesn't believe in it. So it's all humbug, like all just nonsense, really. He doesn't believe in the whole idea of Christmas. So when someone mentions it, when he says Merry Christmas, he goes, bah, humbug. It's all, a, it's all a humbug. It's all a load of nonsense. These days, Bar humbug is an expression which people do actually use at Christmas. It has become an expression which is associated with someone not enjoying Christmas. But it's a negative expression. It means, so if someone says bar humbug to you, it means that you're being grumpy and you're not enjoying the festive season. Like, do you want to come to the Christmas party? Nah, nah, it's all a load of nonsense, isn't it, Christmas? Uh, oh, bloody Christmas. Oh, bar humbug. You know. It's an expression that is used to refer to someone not enjoying Christmas or someone being grumpy. It can be used as a criticism of someone or an expression of your dislike of the Christmas period. So if you say, ah, oh, bar humbug, you know that you're being grumpy, but you're saying it as an expression of, you know, your dislike of the Christmas period. All right, then, that's that. Let's get into the story. OK, here we go. A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. And first we have the preface by Charles Dickens, the little paragraph that he wrote uh, and just at the beginning of the story. So this is these are Charles Dickens's words. I've tried in this ghostly little book to raise the ghost of an idea which will not put my readers in a bad mood in any way. I hope it haunts their houses pleasantly and that no one wishes to put it down their faithful friend and servant, Charles Dickens, December 1843. Okay, so here we go. After 18 minutes, sorry for the wait, everyone. Um, after about 18 minutes or so, let's begin the story. Are you ready? Are you sitting comfortably? Okay, let's begin. Part one, Marley's ghost. Marley was dead to begin with. This must be understood or this story will mean nothing to anybody. So we start with the fact that Scrooge's business partner Marley had died and Scrooge now carried on the money lending business alone. He never removed old Marley's name from the door of the office, even though his old partner was definitely dead. The company was known still as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people called Scrooge Scrooge and sometimes they got his name wrong and called him Marley but he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, Scrooge was a selfish old git. He was as cold as a freezing winter night and he didn't thaw one degree at Christmas. He hated Christmas and everything it stood for. No season of goodwill for him. It was just another excuse to grumble and moan and stay at home counting his money. One dark Christmas Eve, Old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house, counting out his money. It was freezing, foggy weather outside. Scrooge had a very small fire in his office, but next door, in his clerk's office, the poor fire was even smaller and hardly even warm at all. His poor clerk, called Bob Cratchit, had worked for Scrooge for years and yet had never once received a pay rise. Merry Christmas, Uncle, said Scrooge's nephew, Fred, coming into the room. Bah, said Scrooge. Humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle, he said. You don't mean that, do you? If it was up to me, said Scrooge indignantly, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. The nephew answered, Don't be angry, Uncle. Come to our place for Christmas tomorrow. Bah, humbug. 
Christmas. Don't talk to me about Christmas. It's all just a big jumped up shopping spree invented by the Americans. The whole thing is just a scam to get the money out of your pocket. Well, not mine. I'm keeping mine. You do Christmas your way and I'll do it my way here on my own, just like every other day. Thank you very much. Suit yourself, uncle, but we'll miss you this year again, said Scrooge's nephew. Merry Christmas, uncle. Good afternoon, said Scrooge. His nephew even stopped to wish Merry Christmas to the clerk. The poor cold clerk, Bob Cratchit, managed a thin smile and a weak Merry Christmas in return as Scrooge's nephew left. As he left, Fred let two other people in. They entered and bowed to Scrooge. Mr Scrooge or Mr Marley, said one of the gentlemen. Mr Marley, Scrooge replied, died seven years ago this very night. Oh, sorry for your loss, said one of the men. What do you want? snapped Scrooge. Mr Scrooge, said the gentleman, it looks like it's going to be an especially freezing winter this year. A few of us are going to buy some meat and drink for the poor and some blankets to keep them warm this Christmas. What would you like to give? Nothing, said Scrooge. If they've got no money, they can borrow it, or failing that, go to the debtors' prisons. Many would rather die than do that. If they would rather die, said Scrooge, they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Scrooge went back to his work. Meanwhile, it got even foggier, darker and colder outside. Some carol singers walked by Scrooge's office. One cold young boy stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to sing a Christmas carol. God bless you, merry gentlemen, may nothing you dismay. As soon as he heard it, Scrooge jumped up so that the singer fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to the fog. Eventually, closing time arrived. Scrooge nodded to the clerk, Mr Cratchit, who instantly snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. "'You'll want all day off tomorrow, I suppose,' said Scrooge. "'Yes, please, Mr Scrooge. Christmas Day, you know. It's only once a year, after all.' "'A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December,' said Scrooge. "'No day off for you. I expect you to be here extra early next morning.' Cratchit just looked at him. Scrooge went home to his gloomy house. The yard outside was dark, and the fog and frost hung about the place. As he approached his door something strange happened. Now, the knocker, the knocker on his door was very large and ordinary, but tonight it looked like, well, it looked like Marley's face. Marley's face. The eyes were wide open, and its greyish colour made it horrible in the half-light. As Scrooge looked more closely, it became a knocker again. He did look carefully, but the knocker was still a knocker. Load of old nonsense, said Scrooge to himself. He closed his door and double-locked himself in. He walked through his rooms to see that everything was all right and then sat by the fire. Humbug! he said. Stupid Christmas. I'll be glad when it's all over and people start acting normally again. And then he heard it. A clanking noise from the cellar, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain. Sounded kind of like this. Hmm. Scrooge tried to ignore it and opened his paper Listeners, this is, you can hear the clanking of chains and the sort of scraping sounds. This is what suddenly Scrooge could hear. He tried to ignore it and opened his paper. Then he heard the sound again. 
the noise of heavy chains being dragged and a faint sound of moaning. Scrooge suddenly sat upright in his chair. The noise was real, and it was getting louder. Suddenly the cellar door flew open with a booming sound, and then he heard the noise coming up the stairs, then straight towards his door. Quickly it came on through the heavy door and passed into the room right in front of his eyes. It was Jacob Marley, back from the dead. The chain Marley pulled was long and made of cash boxes, keys, padlocks and purses. His body was transparent so that Scrooge could see the buttons on his coat hanging on the door behind. What do you want with me? said Scrooge. Who are you? In life I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Humbug, I tell you, humbug! At this the spirit raised a frightful cry and shook its chain. Scrooge fell upon his knees. The ghost asked, do you believe in me or not? I do, said Scrooge, I do, but why do spirits walk the earth and why do they come to me? It is required of every man, the ghost returned, that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men, and if that spirit does not go forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. What? What do you mean? said Scrooge failing to understand. Your spirit, it does not walk with his fellow men, and will be condemned to walk the earth after your death. Do you understand, Scrooge? Scrooge just continued to stare, trembling. But, but you are chained, he said. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life, and by the very work I did with you, replied the ghost. I made it link by link, and yard by yard, and of my own free will I wore it. Scrooge trembled <laughs> more and more. <sighs> Do you know, pursued the ghost, your chain was as heavy as this seven Christmas Eves ago. You have made it longer since then. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob, faltered Scrooge. Business? cried the ghost, wringing its hands. <laughs> Mankind was my business. Greed was my business. I spent my life on this earth, obsessing over money and mistreating the poor and the needy to fill my pocket. Old Scrooge, I am condemned to walk the earth for eternity, never to find rest or peace. I am here tonight to warn you continued the ghost. You will be haunted by three spirits. Uh, I, th I think I'd rather not, said Scrooge. They will come to teach you a lesson. Expect the first tomorrow, said the ghost, when the bell tolls one. Expect the second on the next night at the same hour, the third upon the next night at the last stroke of twelve. When it had said these words, the spectre floated out upon the bleak, dark night. The air was filled with moaning phantoms, and every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. They faded away. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was still double locked. As he'd done with his own hands, he tried to say humbug, but stopped, and he went straight to bed and fell asleep instantly. Okay, that's part one. Woo, scary stuff. I, I, I wonder if I need to explain much, really. Um, I don't think it's necessary to explain a lot, except to say that So uh, Scrooge um, is obviously a very grumpy and very rude person. Uh, he's When his nephew wishes him Happy Christmas, he just says it's a humbug, it's a load of nonsense. Uh, he demands that his poor uh, clerk, uh, Bob Cratchit, comes first thing in the morning. He demands that he comes to the office first thing in the morning, even though tomorrow it's Christmas Day. Um, 
Normally that should be a public holiday, but he demands that he comes. I mean, these days that's a public holiday. It's, it's illegal for an employer to actually make someone work on that day. But, um, you know, many years ago that was not illegal and employers like Scrooge could just do whatever they wanted, you know, they could force their staff to come to work even on a day like Christmas Day. Uh, and, you know, unless they were a very kind-hearted boss, you know, that they, they were able to do that. Um, <clears throat> Some some charity workers come to visit um, Scrooge and uh, they ask him to give money to charity because they're going to give money to the poor. They're going to help the poor, give them food and shelter. And Scrooge basically says no. If they need money, they can borrow it. All right? So it's not very nice, is it? And uh, Scrooge goes home and when he approaches his door, he notices that the knocker on the door, so a, a knocker is a metal thing which is used to knock the door, right? Instead of, you know, a, a, these days obviously we have um, uh, doorbells, ding dong, but in those days it was a metal knocker, knock, knock, knock on the door. He notices that the metal knocker looks strange and for a moment it looks like the face of his old partner, Jacob Marley, right? Um, which is disturbing, but he kind of ignores it and carries on. And he goes into his home, locks the door, you know, double locks the door, and then the ghost visits him. And uh, th he hears the sound of chains being dragged in the distance, and the, ch the sound gets closer and closer, and suddenly the, the ghost is there in the room with him, and it's the ghost of his old business partner, Jacob Marley, um, and Scrooge is frightened, and Marley tells him that he is essentially condemned to walk the earth, meaning that he, uh, as a sort of punishment, um, he has to haunt the earth, walk the earth as a ghost, so he's kind of stuck in limbo, um, and... Um, because he was selfish in his life, because he, you know, um, was mean-spirited with other people and only um, did business with other people for his own selfish um, um, reasons. Uh, and so because of that, uh, he was condemned to, to haunt the earth as a ghost and warn other people not to do the same thing. So that's why he's there to tell Scrooge, be careful, because if you carry on like this, then um, you'll end up like me. And uh, it's been, you know, seven years ago, the, the, your chains were as long as mine, and you've added seven more years since then. So change your ways, or you will end up like me, a spirit stuck in limbo, um, haunting, um, you know, haunting the earth, never able to rest, and, ch you know, carrying these chains. Um, okay, so, uh, the spirit also says that Scrooge is going to be visited by three, uh, the three spirits who are going to show him different visions. Okay, all right, so let's carry on then. All right, so here we go with part two. Uh, the first of the spirits. When Scrooge woke up, it was dark. The chimes of a neighbouring church struck the hour with a single deep melancholy note. Dong! Light flashed up in the room and the curtains of his bed were drawn aside by a hand and Scrooge found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them right in front of his face. It was a strange figure, like a child or an old man. Its white hair hung about its neck and down its back, and yet the face had no wrinkles in it at all. Its legs and feet were bare. It wore a white tunic with a shining belt. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand and had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. "'Are you the spirit whose coming was foretold to me?' asked Scrooge. The voice was soft and gentle. I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past, inquired Scrooge. No, your past. It put out its strong hand and clasped him gently by the arm. Rise and walk with me. They passed through the wall and stood on an open country road. Now it was a clear, cold winter day with snow on the ground. "'Good heavens!' said Scrooge, recognising the place where they were standing. "'I was a boy in this place!' 
he wiped a tear and begged the ghost to lead him. You remember the way? inquired the spirit. Remember it? cried Scrooge. I could walk it blindfolded. They walked along the road, Scrooge recognising every gate and tree, until a little town appeared in the distance. Some shaggy ponies trotted towards them with boys upon their backs. All these boys shouted to each other merrily. Scrooge knew them all. They were his old schoolmates. He called out to them by name, but the boys didn't respond. These are but shadows of the things that have been, said the ghost. They do not see us. Scrooge was filled with happiness when he heard them tell each other Merry Christmas as they parted. But why? What was Merry Christmas to Scrooge? What good had it ever done to him? The school is not quite deserted, said the ghost. A lonely child, neglected and ignored by his friends, is there still. Scrooge said he knew it, and he cried. They soon approached a large house, its windows broken and the many rooms cold with no food in them. They went, the ghost and Scrooge, to the back of the house, to a room with desks. At one of these a lonely boy was reading near a feeble little fire, and Scrooge sat down beside his poor forgotten self, as he used to be. He said, Poor boy! and cried again. I wish, Scrooge muttered after drying his eyes with his cuff, I wish, but it's too late now. What is the matter? asked the spirit. Nothing, said Scrooge, nothing. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should have given him something, that's all. The ghost smiled thoughtfully and waved its hand saying as it did so, let us see another Christmas. And there he was, alone again, when all the other boys had gone home for the holidays. The door opened, a little girl rushed in and put her arms around his neck. I've come to bring you home, dear brother, said the child. We're going to be together all Christmas long and have the best time in the world. Your sister, said the ghost, always a delicate creature, but she had a large heart. So she had, cried Scrooge, your right spirit. She died when she was a woman, said the ghost, and had, I think, one child, your nephew. Scrooge answered sadly, yes. Suddenly they were in a busy city. Here too, it was Christmas time again, but it was evening and the streets were decorated with Christmas lights. The ghost stopped at a warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Know it, said Scrooge. I was apprenticed here. This is where I did my training. When he saw an old gentleman behind a high desk, Scrooge cried in great excitement. Look, it's Fezziwig, alive again, my old boss. Scrooge's former self, now a young man, came in beside his fellow apprentice, a young man called Dick. Old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked up at the clock. He rubbed his hands and called out in a rich voice, No more work tonight, my boys, said Fezziwig. Christmas Eve, Dick! Christmas, Ebenezer! Clear everything away, lads! It was done in a minute. The floor was swept the tables were cleared away, fuel was heaped onto the fire, and the warehouse became a snug, warm and bright ballroom. In came a fiddler with a music book. In came Mrs Fezziwig and the three Miss Fezziwigs. In came all the young men and women employed in the business. The housemaid, the baker, the cook, the milkman, and the party started. There were dances and games. There was cake and roast beef and mince pies and plenty of ale. During all this time, Scrooge has a had acted like a man out of his mind. He enjoyed everything. Now that he remembered the ghost, he became conscious that it was looking full upon him. 
A small matter, said the ghost, for Fezziwig, to make these silly folks so full of gratitude and happiness. Small? echoed Scrooge. It isn't that spirit. He has the power to make our work a pleasure or a pain. The happiness he gives, it's, it's so big. As if it cost a fortune, and... He stopped. What is the matter? asked the ghost. Oh, nothing in particular, said Scrooge. Something, I think, the ghost insisted. No, said Scrooge. No, it, it's just that I would like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now, that's all. Scrooge and the ghost again stood in the open air. I'm running out of time, observed the spirit. Quick! Again, Scrooge saw himself. He was older now. He was not alone, but sat next to a pretty young girl. In her eyes there were tears. It matters little to you, she said softly. Another idol has taken my place. It is the love of money. Goodbye. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. Spirit, cried Scrooge, show me no more. I cannot bear it. Leave me. Take me back. Haunt me no longer. He was conscious of being exhausted and of being in his own bedroom. He had barely time to fall onto bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. Okay. Whew. All right. So what happened in part two? The spirit of Christmas past, past visited him. This strange spirit who's kind of otherworldly and um, is both very old and very young at the same time. This kind of weird, timeless, creepy spirit with this smooth voice um, bring, takes Scrooge to and sh takes Scrooge and shows him uh, different moments from his past. The first one is um, first they visit a place where Scrooge was a little boy and it sounds like, it seems like Scrooge was an orphan or something. There's no sign of his parents so maybe he was an orphan. He lived in an orphanage it seems and there were the other boys there uh, who he was delighted to see but apparently the other boys all went home uh, for the holidays, the Christmas holidays, but poor little Scrooge had to stay in this house all on his own, and it was very cold. Uh, so clearly Scrooge started uh, life very poor and on his own. It's a sad story. Um, then what happens? Then we see, um, yeah, then we see Scrooge has a sister, and his sister is obviously very, very lovely, and she has a big heart, but the, the ghost says that the sister, she was delicate. Um, so now it seems that the sister, she died at some point, but she did have a child. Um, and, you know, the, the point here is that this is the only person who, with, who showed any warmth to Scrooge was his lovely sister. Uh, sadly, she died, but she did leave um, a nephew. So this is, you know, Scrooge's only family, probably the only person who, again, shows him any sense of emotional warmth or care. But as we noticed at the beginning of the story, Scrooge is just rude and dismissive to him and refuses to accept his invitation to spend Christmas with him. Um, and then the, uh, the ghost uh, shows uh, Scrooge another scene, and this is Scrooge later in life with a girl a girl who probably, he, maybe he was engaged to be married to her or he was, you know, possibly going to get married to this girl, you know, his girlfriend or something, I suppose. Uh, but the girl is basically saying goodbye to him. So they're splitting up because she has decided that, you know, he only cares about money. So he's, uh, Scrooge is alone because he maybe he there was a, uh, um, a girl who he could have been in love with, who he could have married, but the relationship didn't work because apparently Scrooge um, was emotionally cold and only cared about money. And this shows you the direction that his life took, where he became a cold, emotionless, greedy person focused on money, and it was at the cost of a loving relationship with a, with a woman. 
Scrooge is very upset to see all these things and he's feeling a lot of regret. He wishes that he could have gone back to the carol singer who visited his, his door uh, the night before. He wished that he could say some nice things to his um, his clerk. Oh yeah, the, the other thing, he also visits uh, a place where uh, he used to work as an apprentice, so where he did his, his professional training. Um, with the, his old boss called Fezziwig. And Fezziwig apparently was a great boss, uh, someone who was generous with his staff and his trainees and his family at Christmas time, and someone who was a boss who was warm and generous, generous enough to put on a big party at Christmas time. And Scrooge noticed that his boss had this power, this responsibility to make the lives of his staff uh, wonderful or terrible by his, you know, with his decisions. So again, this makes Scrooge reflect on how he treats his uh, his staff, namely Bob Cratchit. Okay, S the spirit takes Scrooge back to his bed. Scrooge falls asleep again. So we continue, part three. Okay, so here we go, part three, the second of the three spirits. Scrooge waited again, lying in his bed in the darkness. Now, when the bell struck one, he saw a ghostly light coming from the next room. He shuffled to the door. A strange voice called him by his name and told him to enter. The room was hung with holly and mistletoe and a huge fire went roaring up the chimney. Heaped up like a throne were geese, pies, plum puddings, chestnuts, oranges, pears, cakes and punch. Upon this food couch there sat a jolly giant, who held a glowing torch high up to shed its light on Scrooge. Come in, exclaimed the ghost, and know me better, man. Scrooge entered timidly and hung his head. I am the ghost of Christmas present, said the spirit. Look upon me. Scrooge reverently did so. The ghost was wearing a green robe bordered with white fur. Its feet were bare, and on its head it wore a holly wreath, set here and there with shining icicles. "'You've never seen the like of me before!' exclaimed the spirit. "'Spirit,' said Scrooge, "'take me where you want. I went out last night, and I learnt a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have anything to teach me, let me profit by it.' Here, touch my robe. Feast, fire, room, all vanished instantly, and they stood in the city streets on a snowy Christmas morning. The sky was gloomy, and yet there was an air of cheerfulness, like a summer day. Soon the bells called the people to church, and out they came, flocking through the streets in their best clothes and with their happiest faces. The good spirit led him straight to Scrooge's clerk's house, Bob Cratchit's house, and at the door the spirit smiled and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling. Think of that! Bob had only fifty pounds a week himself, and yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his little house. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, dressed poorly in a worn-out dress. "'Where's your precious father, then?' said Mrs. Cratchit to the little Cratchits. "'And your brother, Tiny Tim?' In came Bob, the father, in his worn-out clothes, and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Sadly, Tiny Tim held a little crutch, which he needed to help him walk. "'And how did little Tim behave?' asked Mrs. Cratchit. As good as gold, said Bob. At last the dishes were set on the table and grace was said. Bob said he didn't believe that a better goose had ever been cooked. Mrs. Cratchit brought in the pudding like a speckled cannonball blazing with brandy and with Christmas holly stuck into the top, a wonderful pudding. Bob proposed a toast. A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. God bless us, everyone, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. He sat very close to his father's side upon 
his little stool, Bob held his withered little hand in his, as he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Spirit, said Scrooge, with an interest he'd never felt before, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat, replied the ghost, in the corner, and a crutch without an owner. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no, said Scrooge. Oh no, kind spirit, say that he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, he will die this year, repeated the ghost. And and decrease the surplus population. Scrooge hung his head, ashamed to hear his own words. Man, said the ghost, are you the one to decide who should live and who should die? It may be that in the sight of heaven you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. But now Scrooge heard his own name. Mr. Scrooge, toasted Bob, I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast indeed, cried Mrs. Cratchit, reddening. My dear, was Bob's mild answer, Christmas Day. I'll drink to his health for your sake and the days, said Mrs. Cratchit. Long life to him, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. The children drank the toast after her, but they didn't care for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The monster, the mention of his name, cast a dark shadow on the party. By and by they had a song from Tiny Tim, who had a sweet little voice and sang it very well indeed. They were not a handsome family, they were not well dressed, but they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another and contented with the time that they had. Scrooge watched them, and especially Tiny Tim, until the end. And now they travelled through coal miners' homes, past ships on the dark sea, and everywhere they went, no matter how poor, every person hummed a Christmas tune or had a Christmas thought, and every person, good or bad, had a kind word for another on that day. Scrooge heard a hearty laugh and recognised it as his own nephew's. He found himself in a bright, gleaming room with the spirit standing, smiling by his side. Ha ha ha! laughed Scrooge's nephew. He said that Christmas was a humbug, a load of nonsense, and he believed it too. More shame for him, Fred, said Scrooge's niece indignantly. He's a comical old fellow, said Scrooge's nephew, and not as pleasant as he could be. However, his offences carry their own punishment, and I'm sorry for him. Who is it that suffers from his ill temper? Himself, always. They had some music and played some games, because it's good to be children sometimes, and never better than at Christmas. They all played and sang, and so did Scrooge, singing quite loud. He begged like a boy to be allowed to stay until the guests departed. But this, the spirit said, could not be done. They saw many things and went to many places, and everywhere the spirit went he left his blessing. It was a long night, and Scrooge noticed that the ghost grew older, and he noticed that its hair was grey. Are spirits' lives so short? asked Scrooge. My life upon this globe is very brief, replied the ghost. It ends tonight at midnight. Listen, the time is drawing near. The bell struck twelve, and the spirit disappeared. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, he beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. Okay, so that's the end of part three. What's happened there? Basically, the ghost of Christmas present is showing him Christmases, you know, that are happening today. 
right? Including the home of Bob Cratchit, who is uh, Scrooge's clerk, who he doesn't pay very much money and so on, right? And uh, Scrooge's family, um, Cratchit's family are very poor, but they're happy. It's a loving family. The little boy, the youngest of the family, Tiny Tim, he's sick. Um, uh, and, you know, his, his, his parents adore him. Um, and they want to protect him. Um, basically, they're poor, but they're happy and they love each other and they're happy with what they've got. And even though Scrooge is such a nasty, horrible, uh, mean boss, they even raise a toast. They even raise their glasses to him, to his name um, at Christmas. Um, you know, they're, a, they're good people, you know, basically. And the spirit shows Scrooge other Christmases all all over the place and people are also having a similar time, except Scrooge himself. Okay, right, let's move on. Part four, the last of the spirits. The phantom approached in deep black robes, which left nothing of it visible except for one bony hand. So this spirit is like some kind of skeleton or something, but it's covered in dark robes, like a Dementor or something from Harry Potter, you know? Um, in dark robes with a bony hand. Am I in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come? said Scrooge. You are about to show me shadows of the things that will happen. Is that so, spirit? Scrooge's legs trembled beneath him. Ghost of the future, he exclaimed. I fear you more than any spectre I have seen. But I know your purpose is to do me good. <laughs> and I am prepared to bear your company and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? It gave him no reply. The hand was pointed straight ahead. Lead on, said Scrooge. Lead on. The night is precious to me, I know. Lead on, spirit. The phantom moved away. They were in the heart of the city, amongst the merchants who hurried up and down and chinked the money in their pockets as Scrooge had often seen them do. The spirit stopped beside one little knot of businessmen, a group of businessmen, pointing to them. Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, said one of the men. I don't know much about it. I only know he's dead. When did he die? inquired another. Last night, I believe. What's he done with all his money? I haven't heard said the first man, yawning. <sighs> it's likely to be a, a very cheap funeral. I don't know anybody who would go to it. Well, I don't mind going if a lunch is provided, <laughs> laughed one gentleman. Scrooge knew the men and looked towards the spirit for an explanation. Scrooge felt that the unseen eyes of the ghost were looking at him closely. It made him <sighs> shudder and feel very cold. They went into a dirty part of town where the shops and houses reeked with filth and misery. There was a shop where greasy old junk was bought. Scrooge and the Phantom came into this shop, called Old Joe's, just as two women and a man carried in several bags of stuff laughing. The man produced his takings first. A pencil case and a brooch were all he had. Old Joe added up his prices upon the wall. "'I know these things,' said Scrooge. "'They're just like mine. "'And they're worth much more money than this man is paying.' "'Who's next?' said Joe. "'Mrs Dilber was next. "'Sheets and towels, two old-fashioned silver teaspoons, "'a pair of sugar tongs, and a few boots. "'Her account was stated on the wall in the same manner.' I paid two shillings ten for teaspoons, just like those, Scrooge objected. And now open up my bag, Joe, said the next woman. Joe dragged out a large and heavy roll of some dark stuff, the same fabric and colour as Scrooge's bed curtains. Bed curtains, said Joe. You don't mean to say you took them down, rings and all, with him lying there dead? Yes, I do, replied the woman. Why not? What, his blankets too? Whose else do you think, replied the woman? And that's the best shirt he had, and a fine one too. 
They'd have wasted it if it hadn't been for me. Putting it on him to be buried in, they were. She laughed. But I took it off again. Scrooge looked at a shirt, just like his own shirt, and listened in horror. Ha, 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 laughed the same woman when old Joe paid out the money in return for the shirt and the other things. This is the end of it, you see. He frightened everyone away from him when he was alive to profit us when he was dead. Spirit, said Scrooge, shuddering from head to foot. I see, I see, the case of this unhappy man might be my own. Merciful heaven, what is this? He recoiled in terror, for the scene had changed, and now he almost touched a bed, a bare, uncurtained bed, on which, beneath a ragged sheet, there lay the body of this man. He lay in the dark, empty house, with no one to tell his story or mourn his death. Spirit, Scrooge said, this is a fearful place, let us go. The ghost led him to poor Bob Cratchit's house and found the mother and the children seated around the fire. Very quiet, the little Cratchits were as still as statues in one corner, with Peter, who had a book in front of him. The mother and her daughters were sewing, but certainly they were very quiet. The mother laid her work upon the table and put her hand up to her face. Well, your father should have been home by now, she said. Peter said, shutting up his book, But I think he's walked a little slower than he used to these last few evenings, mother. At last, she said, He used to walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder, very fast indeed. But he was very light to carry, and his father loved him so. Ah, there's your father at the door. She hurried out to meet him. Bob broke down all at once and cried. He couldn't help it. They gathered in front of the fire and talked. Bob told them of the extraordinary kindness of Mr Scrooge's nephew, whom he had scarcely seen but once. I'm terribly sorry about this, Mr Cratchit, Fred had said, and sorry for your good wife. I'm sure that none of us will forget poor tiny Tim, shall we? Never, father, they all cried. Spectre, said Scrooge, tell me what man that was whom we saw lying dead. The ghost of Christmas yet to come did not answer, but led him straight on until they reached an iron gate, a churchyard. Here, then, the wretched man, whose name he had now to learn, lay underneath the ground. Answer me one question said Scrooge. Are these the shadows of the things that will be, or are they shadows of things that may be only? The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one of them. Scrooge followed the finger and read upon the stone of the grave his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. The finger pointed from the grave to him, and back again. No, spirit, no, oh no, no. The finger was still there. Spirit, he cried, tightly clutching at its robe. Hear me, I am not the man I was, I've changed. Why show me this, if I am past all hope? For the first time, the hand appeared to shake. Good spirit, he pursued, I will honour Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they have taught me. Oh, tell me I can remove the writing on this stone. In his agony, he caught the spectral hand. The phantom's hood and dress shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. Okay, that's the end of part four. What happened? Gosh, what actually happened? I can't, can't quite remember. I was a bit too involved in the story there. Um, it's the spirit of Christmas yet to come. So this is the spirit of the future. Okay. And okay, so basically what Scrooge 
is seeing, what this spirit is showing him is that Scrooge has died and um, people are talking about him. People don't care that he died. People are only wondering about his belongings, about his money, who's going to get the money, who's going to get his stuff. No one actually cares about him. His body is left lying on the bed. Then his body is buried in the cemetery. No one is there to mourn his death. Um, even people are bringing his belongings, like his clothes and his, 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 like silver spoons and stuff from his kitchen, the curtains from the wall. Even the shirt that he was wearing has been removed from his his dead body. And this is being uh, sold uh, in some terrible horrible shop in a bad part of town uh, all his belongings are being sold there by uh, people who don't care about him um so this is this is tragic stuff right this is really really tragic stuff and scrooge can't bear to see it he can't bear the idea that he's he's just lying there dead um you know uh, with with people just taking his belongings um, you know the, the this is his legacy right um Okay, so then let's move on to part five then. So here we are, part five, the end of it. Yes, so the, at the end, the spirit, he's you know, imploring the spirit, like asking the spirit to to give him a chance because he's learned his lesson and he's going to change his ways. And he, he's desperate, you know, for the spirit to to understand that he's, he's definitely going to be different. He's going to live um, with the spirit of Christmas in his heart right he's going to change his ways and he grabs the hand of this spirit the bony hand and as he does so the spirit sort of disappears and instead there's a bedpost the the, the wooden post of uh, one of uh, the wooden post one of the wooden posts of his bed is just there in front of him so part five the end of it yes and the bedpost was his own the bed was his own the room was his own best and happiest of all the time before him was his own time to make amends to make changes to fix things i will live in the past the present and the future scrooge repeated as he scrambled out of bed the spirits of all three shall strive within me oh jacob marley christmas time be praised for this i say it on my knees old jacob on my knees his face was wet with tears. They are not torn down, cried Scrooge, folding one of his bed curtains in his arms. They are not torn down, rings and all. They are here. I am here. The shadows of the things that would have been may be dispelled. They will be. I know they will. I can change the future. I don't know what to do, cried Scrooge, laughing and crying in the same breath. I'm as light as a feather. I'm as happy as an angel. I'm as merry as a schoolboy. I'm as giddy as a, as a drunken man. A Merry Christmas to everybody. A Happy New Year to all the world. He'd hurried into the sitting room and was now standing there. There's the door by which the ghost of Jacob Marley entered, cried Scrooge, starting off again and going around the fireplace. There's the corner where the ghost of Christmas Present sat. There's the window where I saw the wandering spirits. It's all right. It's all true. It all happened. <laughs> really, for a man who'd been out of practice for so many years, it was a splendid laugh. I don't know what day of the month it is, cried Scrooge. I don't know how long I've been among the spirits. I don't know anything. Never mind. I don't care. The churches began ringing out louder and clearer than he'd ever heard. Clash, clang, hammer, ding, dong, bell. What a glorious, glorious sound. Running to the window, he opened it and put out his head. No fog, no mist, just clear, bright, cold, golden sunlight, heavenly sky, sweet, fresh air, merry bells. What a glorious, glorious day. What day is it today? cried Scrooge, calling downward to a boy in Sunday clothes. Eh? returned the boy. What day is it, my fine fellow? said Scrooge. Today? replied the boy. Why, it's, it's Christmas Day, sir. It's Christmas Day, said Scrooge to himself. 
I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. They can do anything they like. Of course they can. <laughs> of course they can. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello, returned the boy. Do you know the butcher's shop in the next street at the corner? Scrooge inquired. I certainly do, replied the lad. An intelligent boy, said Scrooge. A remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? Not the little turkey, the big one. What, the one as big as me? returned the boy. What a delightful boy, said Scrooge. Yes, yes. Well, it's hanging there now, replied the boy. Is it, said Scrooge, go and buy it. What? exclaimed the boy. Seriously, said Scrooge, go and tell them to bring it here so that I can give them the directions where to take it. Come back with the man and I'll give you a tenner. Come back with him in less than five minutes and I'll give you twenty. The boy was off like a shot. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's, whispered Scrooge, rubbing his hands, laughing. <laughs> he won't know who sent it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. He wrote down the address somehow and went downstairs to open the street door, ready for the coming of the butcher's man. As he stood there waiting for him to arrive, the door knocker caught his eye, the one that had appeared to him as the face of old Jacob Marley the night before. I shall love it as long as I live, cried Scrooge patting it with his hand. It's a wonderful knocker. Ah, here's the turkey. Hello again. Merry Christmas. It was a turkey. Why, it's impossible to carry that to Camden Town, said Scrooge. I'll get you a cab. <laughs> the chuckle with which he said this, and the chuckle with which he paid for the turkey, and the chuckle with which he paid for the cab, and the chuckle, little laugh, which he paid, which he paid the boy were only to be exceeded by the chuckle with which he sat down, <laughs> breathless in his chair again, and chuckled until he cried. He dressed himself up in his best clothes, and at last got out into the streets. The people were by this time all pouring out of their homes, as he'd seen them with the ghost of Christmas present, and Scrooge looked at every one of them with a delighted smile, Three or four good-humoured people said, "'Good morning, sir. Merry Christmas to you.' And Scrooge said often afterwards that of all the happy sounds he'd ever heard, those were the happiest in his ears. He'd not gone far, when coming towards him, he saw the gentleman who'd walked into his counting-house the day before. It sent a pang across his heart to think how this old gentleman would look upon him when they met." but he knew what path lay straight before him, and he took it. Uh, excuse me, said Scrooge, quickening his pace and putting his hand on the gentleman's shoulder. How do you do? I, I hope you succeeded yesterday. It was very kind of you to collect things for the poor. A Merry Christmas to you, sir. Allow me to ask your pardon, and will you have the goodness to allow me to give you... Here Scrooge whispered in his ear. Goodness me! cried the gentleman, as if his breath were taken away. "'My dear Mr. Scrooge, are you serious?' "'If you please,' said Scrooge, "'not a penny less. "'A great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. "'Will you do me that favour? "'My dear sir,' said the other, shaking hands with him, "'I don't know what to say.' "'Don't say anything, please,' retorted Scrooge. "'Will you come and see me?' "'I will,' cried the old gentleman." and it was clear he meant to do it. Thank you, said Scrooge. I am much obliged to you. I thank you so much, and God bless you. He went to church and walked about the streets and watched the people hurrying to and fro and patted children on the head and found that everything gave him pleasure. He'd never dreamed that anything could give him so much happiness. In the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock, but he made a dash and he did it. Knock, knock, knock. 
is your master at home, my dear? said Scrooge to the girl. Uh, yes, sir. Where is he, my love? said Scrooge. He's in the dining room, sir, along with his sister. Uh, I'll show you upstairs, if you'd like. He knows me, they both do, said Scrooge, with his hand already on the dining room lock. I'll go in here myself, my dear. Fred, said Scrooge. Why, bless my soul, cried Fred. Who's that? It's me, it's your Uncle Scrooge. I've come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Let him in. He's lucky Fred didn't shake his arm off. He was made to feel welcome and at home in five minutes. Nothing could be heartier. Wonderful party. Wonderful games. Wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office the next morning. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he had set his heart upon. And he did it. Yes, he did. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. He was a full eighteen and a half minutes late. Scrooge sat with his door wide open so he could see him come into the office. His hat was off before he opened the door. He was on his stool in a jiffy, working away with his pen as if he were trying to make up for his lateness. Hello, growled Scrooge in his accustomed voice, as near as he could feign it. What do you mean by coming in here at this time of day? Uh, I'm very sorry, sir, said Bob. I'm late, I know. You are, repeated Scrooge. Yes, I think you are. Step this way, sir, if you please. Uh, it's only once a year, sir, pleaded Bob. I won't do it again. We had a bit of a party yesterday, sir. I've got ugh, a bit of a hangover, to be honest. But I'm good for work, I promise. Now, I'll tell you what, my friend, said Scrooge. I'm not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, he continued, and therefore, I am about to raise your salary. Bob trembled. He had a momentary idea of knocking Scrooge down, holding him, and calling to the people in the hospital for help and a straitjacket. Like, there's something wrong with him. A Merry Christmas, Bob, said Scrooge, with an earnestness that could not be mistaken, as he clapped him on the back. A merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and try to help your struggling family, and we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon, Bob. Come on, let's get a good warm fire going in the fireplace. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all, and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was like a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, as good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the change in him, but he let them laugh. His own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. He had no further meetings with spirits ever again, and people always said about him that he knew how to do Christmas properly, if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us, and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. So there you go, that is the end of the story. I really hope you enjoyed that. It's a good story, isn't it? Don't you think? It is a good story. It's got a good message and so on. I think you understood that at the end of the story, uh, Scrooge was a, uh, a reformed man, a changed man, and he goes out and is super generous with everyone, and he reconnects with his nephew Fred, and they have a wonderful dinner together, and then he's kind to Bob Cratchit, and he raises his salary, and in fact looks after him and his family, and becomes the good boss, like Mr. Fezziwig um, was to him previously. Uh, so a heartwarming story at the end. Um, so a bit scary, a bit chilling at some moments, that story, but ultimately it's a heartwarming tale and I hope you enjoyed it. Okay. What do you think um, 
Supermarket Santa. What did you think? Ho, 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 ho. I really enjoyed it, Luke. Ho, ho. Merry Christmas. Wow. What a sort of jolly uh, Supermarket Santa you really are. Um, and uh, listeners, I don't know if you could hear the noises in the corridor outside my room. You may have been able to hear banging and crashing sounds. That's not a ghost, uh, as far as I know. Uh, hopefully not. I don't think I'm being haunted by any kind of spirits. Uh, but there is a guy who's doing work uh, in the corridor, and hopefully that didn't disturb uh, your enjoyment of the story. Um, I think that he probably overheard a lot of those. <laughs> a lot of he probably overheard me telling that story. He's probably wondering to himself, what is going on in that room? <laughs> what is this guy doing in there? Um, being haunted by spirits and stuff. I don't know what he thinks. Uh, I'll, when I leave to go and have my lunch in a minute, I'll just be like, bonjour, like that. As a, and he'll be like, uh, bonjour. <laughs> hmm. Anyway, <laughs> maybe he listens to Luke's English podcast. Who knows? Well, he does now. He did today anyway, without even realising it. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. I really hope you've enjoyed it. Um, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Season's greetings. If you don't celebrate Christmas, just, you know, happy, um, happy time, <laughs> I guess. Thank you, for, thank you for listening to my podcast. Um, yeah, there's going to be like one more double episode before the end of the year. Okay, uh, so that will come soon. And then, um, well, I'm going to be on holiday and I'll be back doing podcasts again in the new year. Okay, everyone. Uh, so until then, until next time, anyway, I will now wish you a very, very, very festive goodbye, wherever you are in the world, whatever you're doing, whether it's morning, afternoon, evening or night. Thank you. Take care. Be good to each other. And goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.